That's me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, welcome to the TRT World Forum 2017. This is the kickoff panel. We hope to have some fun. We hope to have some conversation. We hope to find some ideas. I would like to introduce our guests for today. Karen Von Hippel, come on down. Um, Director General of the Royal United Services Institute. Stephen Chan, Professor of the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS University. Golder Ibet, a professor, senior advisor to the president of Turkey. Whoa. Pan Wei, director of the Center of Chinese and Global Affairs at the School of International Studies at Beijing University. Thank you. And finally, from South Africa, Kingsley Machiavella from Brand, South Africa. This is, a, this is a gentleman you should all pay particular attention to over the next 48 hours. Okay, we're going to start off with a little film to get you all in the mood. Okay, a reminder, this is your conference, not ours. Redefining the global agenda, old guard, new players. This panel is structured to grapple with an enormous amount of incompatible economic interests and antagonistic political interests. What we're faced with this morning is a hellish cocktail and the ice in our drink comes from the many and toxic, extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds that flow across social media. All of that and more have a huge impact on how individuals and their leaders react to attempts to reshape the global order. So here's my question. What is the established global order? And once we figure that out, does redefining the global order mean we endure a war before there are any meaningful re redefinitions or reconstructions of that order? And at what dollar figure does the cost of compassion trigger the economic law of diminishing marginal utility? A fancy way of saying, hey, this just ain't worth the price of admission. Cost of rebuilding Syria, for instance, according to the World Bank, one trillion dollars. And I'd like you to think about this panel. Fighting global terrorism, terrorism is an expensive business. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute estimates the global order is spending multiples of 100 billion dollars on combating terrorism. Of course, we can argue that money is necessary. We must spend it. But I'm going to ask the panel and our guests today to reframe your positions on, around this passage from a Wall Street investment brochure. Quote, the recent uptick in terrorist activities has many countries increasing the amount of spend 
on counterterrorism activities that providing you with an investment opportunity. And here's what the terrorists say in some of their financial literature. The material cost of a suicide bombing is as low as $150. This modest investment, they write, will result in an average of 12 deaths. Hey, am I not alone in thinking there's big money to be made in swords and apparently very little to be made in plowshares? The global order has not only created a market in upheaval, it's created an industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please think about this. Like it or not, we've industrialized anti-terrorism. And that, as we're faced with today, is shaking the very foundation of the established economic order. So here's the big double-barrel question we're going to grapple with today. And I'd argue the only question, because it cuts, perhaps uncomfortably, to the DNA percolating in this morning's session. What are the new players going to do that's any different from what the old guard is already doing? Does the collision between the immovable object of politics and the irresistible force of profits make redefining the global agenda little more than a hollow exercise or a sociology class? And I'm going to issue a challenge to everyone in this room who are leading the charge to redefine the global order. Are you willing to support change that will endanger your own position? People do not consider the alternative to the liberal order. There's a lack of imagination on what can really happen. July 1914, October 1917, January 1933. Have we been down this road before? So, originality is unexplored territory. We're going to go there today by carrying a canoe. You can't take an Uber there. And we're going to start off with a question to Kingsley. How are you doing, my friend? I'm, I'm due out there. I thought you were kidding me that you, no, you were going to no, make me the we're question. Not, we're not speak. Joke, we don't joke around at the forum. Okay. Kingsley, here's my question, if I can find it. <laughs> okay, how is it possible to forge equitable opportunities off the savage and corrupt anvil of past economic inequities that are baked into the system? Oppression comes in many shapes, sizes, and styles. I once asked the greatest man I've ever met how to best handle oppressors. Desmond Tutu said, we may be surprised at the people we find in heaven. God has a soft spot for sinners. His standards are quite low. Sadly, the standards of the global financial markets remain quite high. Fitch, Moody's, and S&P have branded your foreign currency debt to junk. And South Africa is by no stretch alone. So how do we create a new global order when the world is drowning in debt of the old global order? Go for it. Well, thank you very much, Craig. Um, to deal with these issues, we really need to understand the causes of global uncertainty. And I have, I have identified about four of them. Mm -hmm. Poverty, social exclusion, and the growing divide between the poor and the rich, a global security uh, dilemma, and the shift to the far right. These are issues that are really creating this uncertainty around the mm -hmm. world. And we need really to manage issues related to poverty and social inequality. And they bring an element uh, that a uh, lot of people are starting to identify as a push and pull factor. It pushes very good people that we are having, young people we are having in our countries. It pushes them to get involved in terrorism. But terrorism also attracts them. It pulls them away from good things and playing a responsible role in the society. So those are issues that are related to really managing the socioeconomic interests of those people. 
We can't, terrorism is not necessarily a military or requires a military solution. It's a political and socio-economic challenge that we need to address. That's one. The shift uh, that we see to the right, it's cre it creates a lot of intolerance. It pushes people further to uh, the margins. They are isolated in the society. They don't feel useful in the society. And they are then tempted uh, to move to the other extreme that it's, 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 it's presented mm -hmm. across. I mean, people speak about the extreme in terms of one area. There's been a big debate within the Roman Catholic Church around the Juvia. It changes, it challenges the whole notion of who should take a communion. And you've had uh, senior cardinals, Cardinal Burke and a lot of cardinals who are coming up with this intolerance that you start to see even within the Christian faith and challenging the Pope in terms of his outreach to poor people and deal with those issues. The element that relates to security dilemma is a huge thing. Security dilemma concept it simply means that in order to avoid war, prepare for war. And you see countries putting a lot of resources preparing to go to war. Is it useful? Tension that is raising around the world. How are we going to manage those issues? The resources that are supposed to deal with the challenges of socioeconomic development are channeled to military uh, uh, buildup. The challenge that we're seeing in the Korean Peninsula, it's not useful. And the tension that is starting to build yeah, up. We know this. How do we change it? What, what if, if you had the magic wand right now, we'd obviously wipe out world debt, global debt. But, but how do you change this mindset? I, I, I mean, darn it, Kingsley, how many times have all of us in this room had this discussion? You know, you're in the trenches in South Africa. You've seen this. I think the South African experience is, is illustrative of how we can change the mindset of the world here to shift the global order. How do we do that? You have to take away resources from preparing for war. Deal uh -huh. with social, Get deal rid with, of the war resources. Deal with socioeconomic issues because the challenges that you're seeing are not necessarily military challenges. Mm -hmm are socioeconomic challenges. If you don't address the root causes of what makes people to have the propensity to resort to violence, you're not gonna deal with the issues that really attract mm -hmm. them to go to violence. You need to deal with issues of poverty. Human security issues are really fundamental in managing the issues of there's conflict. No there's no money in poverty. People invest in, in weapons system, as Dwight Eisenhower called it, the military industrial complex. Beware of it. How do you, how, how, how do we, how do we change that system? But Craig, what are the benefits of building a huge military establishment? Mm -hmm. It's actually a feel-good attitude. It doesn't deal with poverty issues. It's a feel-good for those who are running this military establishment. But they are failing to understand the fundamentals that are pushing people to violence. And I think that's what we need to manage. Mm -hmm. We're creating a fertile ground by marginalizing a large number of our, our population creating a, fat, a fertile ground for them to, to be recruited by extremes across the board. And these extremes are not only found in one religion, as you may see in many arguments. You find it across the board. So we need to manage those issues. So war marginalizes growth. War marginalizes growth, definitely. And it creates perpetual insecurity. And it feeds on its own, because mm -hmm. the more you have insecurity, the more you get a lot of politicians who are keen to spend more money in new weapon systems. Now we're dealing with the fourth industrial revolution. Are we really trying to help countries and people to catch up with the fourth industrial revolution? Mm. But if you look at the weapon systems are developing so much at a, at a rather very fast right. pace. All right, L look, we're gonna get back to you on this. I wanna now throw this down to Karen, okay? History is littered with wars which everybody knew would never happen. Is the world at war right now? Is the paucity of this, uh, is the horror of this war the paucity of its reverberation? How do we, from your position, how do we get to what Kingsley's talking about here? Okay, small question. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you for inviting me here today to TRT uh, and, and, uh, and the organizers. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. I think. Over the years, for those of us who have studied war, um, we've often made the case that, uh, that we need to do all we can to end the conflicts. And 
we've also seen situations where uh, the U.S., at least, as the leader of this liberal rules-based order, has not always wanted to, uh, to end certain wars. And if you look at Syria as just the most recent example, um, President Obama did not want to uh, interfere robustly in Syria. He didn't want to do it because he didn't want to have another situation like Iraq. Uh, where really it really disrupted so many forces and unleashed so many forces. And so by not interfering in Syria, uh, you know, in, in many ways you can trace so much of today's tumult to the fact that not enough was done to stop that. So the Syria, Syrian civil war uh, festered and ISIL was allowed to grow and uh, incubate and, and plan attacks elsewhere. Uh, the Syrian civil war caused a huge refugee crisis. No country knows that more than, than Turkey, obviously. Um, but if you look at the countries in the region, Turkey, uh, Iraq, and uh, Jordan in particular, and Lebanon, they were only able to hold and to house so many millions of refugees before the, ban the dams burst. And when the dams burst, we saw this massive wave of humanity streaming across Western Europe and Eastern Europe trying to trying to, to find sanctuary. So you have a situation by not doing more in Syria that ISIL metastasizes, ISIL attacks uh, outside of the so-called caliphate. They attack throughout Europe. Turkey has had over 300 civilians killed by ISIL-inspired and ISIL-directed attacks. And uh, you also have a huge migrant cr crisis, which really was, it, it enabled many populist politicians in Europe and in the United States to stir up fears. And so in a sense, you can say, well, not ending a war, not doing more to end a very important civil war. Is war inevitable? Here's what I want to know. The, the, yeah. whole, the whole concept, you mentioned President Erdogan. Okay, so he spends 10 billion Turkish dollar, 10 billion dollars to take care of refugees. Wow, a lot of money. That war, any war, is war inevitable. That's what I want to know. Is war inevitable? You sit in the policy tanks that look at this. Is I mean, can we give a yes or no question to this? I mean, Answer? Con conflict is certainly inevitable, and not all conflict is negative. Conflict can lead to positive change as well. The issues are you have to determine which conflicts need robust intervention and which ones, if you intervene, you might make it worse. So there's no simple answer to that question. All right. Dorman. She works for the president of Turkey, so we got what we call in the news business a catch-up here today. Um, let's see if we can make some news. Do you think the United States and NATO do not take Turkey's security concerns and, or economic interests seriously? It's no secret that NATO is a pre preparatory class to EU membership, and we know where that's gone. Some have argued that the NATO alliance is now too cumbersome and useless in the region. May I ask you, is there a possibility that Turkey will opt out of NATO? I always say as someone who is a NATO expert that, you know, the alliance has had its ups and downs uh, over the years, even during the Cold War when it had definitely had a purpose. After the end of the Cold War, there was always a question, is the alliance dead? Is it moving forward? We've been asking these questions for 25 years. It's still there. Um, I, thought, I think it had its shining moment, you know, for that little uh, glimpse of euphoria we had in the 90s where, mm -hmm. you know, the international community could rise up, international institutions we'd inherited from the Cold War were now suddenly doing collective security, humanitarian intervention, putting wars to an end, you know, descending with 60,000 troops in another country to do peace building and state building, which were never in NATO's original mission. Uh, but I think the 90s are definitely over, and NATO, just like any other uh, Western institution inherited from the Cold War, 
is living through this fatigue of repeating huh. and wishing it was still the 90s, and it's not. <laughs> so it's not a disease, I think, that afflicts NATO uh, per se, but I think it's a disease that affects the West, and this is where I think the West in general, and I'm talking the core, which is the transatlantic relationship, uh -huh. Uh, has come to the point where they're not reading Turkey in the right way because they're not reading the world in the right uh -huh. way. So it, the issue is not really about Turkey, it's about a changing world, a changing region, and a changing Turkey. How is the re explain to us how, how the, the region has changed. Is it correct to say, well, Turkey's in the neighborhood. The U.S. does not like Iran, the U.S. does not like Russia, but guess what? You have to do business with them. They're your neighbors. Mm -hmm. You need to do business with them. That's, that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I think the United States is, um, now you mentioned the United States, so I'll talk specifically about that. I think they're in a sort of period of confusion. I think, you know, we all agree with that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that there is yeah. a lot of confusion. Um, that, you know, the way they've dealt with the Middle East is that it was actually the backyard of the Cold War for many, many years. And, you know, they, they had certain tools to deal with it, such as shuttle diplomacy, supporting Israel, and whatever. Proxy wars were also a part of the Cold War. And I think these tools, this toolbox, is still being used in an age where we, you know, where powers should be looking at this differently. But the main confusion, I think, lies in U.S. grand strategy, which seems to have lost its way in the sense that they want to do some kind of offshore balancing, and that is, you know, outsourcing balancing to local actors and regions while they go off and do other things, but somehow maintain control. I think this is the sticking point. Those uh -huh. who established the post-1945 liberal world order want to hold on to that control, but they don't know how. Uh -huh. And this, I uh -huh. think, is leading to two things. How do we do offshore balancing, but keep that control because we can't be, you know, we can't have this military uh, power projection that we had during the Cold War, we can't afford it anymore. Um, but, you know, how do we do offshore balancing? Do we do it with local actors? Do we do it with allies? Do we do it with proxy fighters on the ground? And there's, there's a big confusion about that. Uh, and the other thing is, um, how do we maintain this global outreach and control while trying to look like we're really not interested? Uh -huh. And I think this is, uh, this is actually the crucial point here. And for a while, institutions, of course, in the 90s were really put forward as those who could maintain that control because let's face it, this order that was, you know, that we... It, and that it was declining. the Soviet threat. It was yeah. the Soviet threat that linked you together. And it's declining, but it's not over. You know, there is no alternative to it. But there's this fear in the West that any alternative to it, and you mentioned this as well, will descend into this dark chaos. And I think, you know, this is where we have to be very brave and say, what is a post-Western world? Uh -huh. You know, and there was this recent lament, I, I won't call it an article, but a lament in the New York Times uh, by David Brooks when he said that this decline of the discourse of Western civilization, which was a global standard setter, there is no alternative to this, otherwise we'll descend into darkness. But with that comes a sense of oughtness about what the world ought to be like, how allies like Turkey ought to behave, how countries in a region ought, and this, all, this oughtness is derived from the way this order was set up because it categorized countries. For example, when this liberal world order was set up after 1945, there was this sense that, you know, for the United States, you had to balance the bigger powers like the Soviet Union or China or later Russia. You couldn't really sort of control them, but you could balance them. And then there were those uh, former powers who were now allies that had to be controlled through economic interdependence and uh, providing for their security, Germany and Japan, in the sphere of influence of the West. Uh -huh. And then there were the other allies. These were largely functional allies, passive allies. Turkey was a functional ally. It had a, you know, it had geostrategic location. Great, has a great army, but it's functional. It's not at the table. It doesn't really have a strategic partnership with the West. Not well, Gunnar, really you, you mentioned. And the, can I just finish? Go ahead. The confusion there is 
Turkey is no longer in that role. Right. And the West is finding it very difficult to say, wait a minute, you used to be a functional ally. Now you're acting like a strategic partner. I am paying lip service to you saying strategic partner now and then, but really, I'm not engaging you as a strategic partner. Well, you so used, this is the confusion with yeah, trying to engage Turkey. You used a word that I think is really critical that's going to lead to my next question for Panwe. You used alternative, an alternative to what we're seeing. Now, let's not mince words. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people in the world who believe that China is not a democratic country. There are quite a few people in the world who would like to change your system. <laughs> what we're talking about here is changing mindsets, alternatives. Here's my question. Do democratic governments, as we know in the West, help or hinder the transition? And I'm going to give you a little piece of help. You may not be aware of this. About a week ago, Yashaka Monk, who is a uh, political scientist and lecturer on political theory at Harvard University, released some data that was pretty shocking. His data showed that millennials in America, the cradle of democracy, are, quote, six times more dissatisfied with the democratic system than they were in the 1940s. Think about that. Then this researcher asked them why. The answer, quote, Americans supported liberal democracy because it made them wealthier. Now it's no longer the case. Do we need democracy as defined in the West? Well, in China, we understand democracy differently. And uh, uh, we don't feel that democracy is just to, to elect leaders. And uh, the top leaders, to, to elect leader, is that democracy, democracy? <laughs> So in China, we would find that uh, uh, the way that people express their will about their welfare and increasing their living standard have a say in about how to improve the quality of life uh -huh. is democracy. So it's more like a people's democracy, we call it. Mm -hmm. And the people's welfare is the most important thing is instead of just electing leaders. Or we have a power only to elect leaders. But you, let me challenge you on that. Around only 6.2% of the Chinese population are members of the Communist Party of China. That's pretty darn small. Is that a problem? Is that democratic? Well, well I think uh, Chinese Communist Party members right now is almost 90 million Correct. and uh, larger than any European country. Uh, whether that's democratic or not, I mean, uh, that's quite representative. Well, I'm it? asking, no, no, <laughs> no, the reason, the reason I'm asking this, okay, uh -huh. because we're talking about essentially changing the global order, uh -huh. okay? Yeah. So that's what I want to talk yeah, about. <laughs> well, I, yes, but what I'm just asking you are mm -hmm. the perceptions mm -hmm. that the old global order are going to throw on you. Mm -hmm. You are not a democratic country. You are a one-party system. Yet this study at Harvard says, guess what? You well, might be doing something right. We don't care about what Harvard says. We mm -hmm. care about what Peking University says. 
<laughs> we are very self-confident, though. And once other people want to label China as uh, those uh, bad words and say non-democratic or anti-democratic or whatever, non-liberal, you know, Chinese don't like to, 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 to be labeled like that because uh -huh. we are more successful than most of others. So this is the source of self-confidence, or you might say self culturally self-confident. So that whether, well, we like the word democracy, and we like to say we are more democratic than you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the difference? Can you, I mean, c tell us this, as we're discussing here how, how to shift the paradigm, paradigm can you give us two ingredients from China that we can put into the mix that might be helpful? Yes, I think uh, to perceive the world order, actually, I think uh, uh, in China we value or have uh, the top important values are two things. Number one is peace. Number two is development. How to obtain this peace and development I think for the world order, I have these three principles proposed here. Number one, that major powers should agree not to impose their own social values on others. That, for me, is the most important lesson that we have learned from the post-Cold War world. Uh -huh. What about economic values? And uh, number two, I think, for the 85% of the people on Earth, that's underdeveloped countries. So that we know that from our own experience, take for example, when I went to the US for a PhD degree 30 years ago, I got in my pocket only 10 US dollars. That's all my whole month's salary. <laughs> but today it's quite different. So what's our experience? Do the infrastructure and uh, tighten our belt and uh, to, to work on our infrastructure. And we believe that the underdeveloped countries and developed countries, the only major difference is about infrastructure. So who is capable of doing this would get people to become rich. Oh. And therefore, that's China's proposal. All major countries work together to build infrastructure in the uh -huh. underdeveloped world Where for prosperity. All right. Are you telling me then I can go right now to Russia where you have China has 36 billion in invested, Pakistan 24 billion, Laos 12 billion, Sri Lanka 12 billion, African countries hundreds of billions. Is the expenditure of your money and the uh, uh, fiscal application of Chinese foreign policy in these parts of the world, are these places for my colleagues as reporters to go to see how China uh, uh, how China would hopefully uh, uh, create or, or add to a new world order? Is that the, the place to go to be for the illustration? No, it's not. It's just an initiative. Uh, Chinese are not good at proposing initiatives in the world and was, has been quite silent in the world. But this is a time that China, because, because of the economic uh, uh, prosperity and economic power, uh -huh. so China has cap capacity to, 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 to put forward this initiative. It's not that China is going to throw all the money around the world. It's just an initiative to say that the whole world work together that to, to do the infrastructure and mm -hmm. in the underdevel among the underdeveloped nations. So this is the second uh, point I want to make about this or the principle. The third one is that we see the need to control the malfeasant capital, the negative part of the capital across borders of the nations. Actually, that damaged the US, Europe, and damaged social organizations across the whole world. So that we propose that major countries sit together and talk about the need and the ways to regulate international capital across the borders, uh -huh. to channel them to positive needs instead of negative needs. To sum up, I would say that liberal world order, actually China is not an enemy to that, but we do see 
some negative things in that. Huh. Actually, China is one of the victims, you might say that also. For example, right now, China is not recognized as a market economy, as a status in WTO. And also, China is suffering, has been suffering high-tech embargo as well as arms embargo. True. And uh, so that we would see in this, this world that it's not about just liberal or market mechanism. We want the private sector and public sector work together and so as to promote peace and development in the world. So that to say, to reduce the bias among each other. Don't foster this conflict among civilizations. Don't impose social values of their own on others. It's not to say that we have a different values like a democracy, liberty, and so on. Mm -hmm. But it's mainly about priority. The different priorities. For Chinese, we are very materialistic. We want to see the welfare, well, well-being of the common people. Just like, what, what, like yesterday, I walked down the streets in this city. I see people are normal. And while well, the others would say, you are enormal. You are abnormal. <laughs> Actually, I think people are normal. It's politicians who are abnormal. Thank you. S Stephen <laughs> Chan, I, I've saved you for last because I, I, I wanted to come to you as our, I look upon you as our panel's philosopher, mm -hmm. our resident observer. And I wanted you to listen to all of this, make a comment before we open it up for some real debate. Now, I, I will admit I'm being cynical here, Stephen, but it strikes me as gruesome and comical that every culture has an expectation that it can always solve problems. Could you illustrate to us here why my observation is not a shameful canard? I think it is shameful. I yes. Tell, it, tell me why, because a lot of people believe that. Well, I think every culture, every so-called civilization is immersed in a conceit that their way of doing things and their way of thinking about things is the correct way. And if you're going to have a true globalism with intermixtures and interconnections and a true global cooperation, that kind of conceit has got to go the way of history. It's got to be a genuine mixing of different ways of thinking. Without that, there will be no peace, there will be no shared objectives. All kinds of questions arise from the discussions we've had so far. When we talk about offshore balancing, for instance, what is it that we're trying to balance? And that's a question that's unanswered because it's not the same balance as the Cold War, even though we try to behave as if it were. How do we balance different confessional beliefs, different theologies, different approaches to God and the universe? How do we balance all kinds of economic interests of the Chinese very much to the forefront there in places exactly like Africa? And how do we go about making war without at the same time spending as much money and making as many efforts in going about negotiations? Where's the twin track that's thought through so when you negotiate with the other side, you know what the other side is thinking, what the other side wants. Without that kind of appreciation of how other people think, what they want, what they aspire to, we're going to be in for a very, very rough ride in the 21st but century. But are, are, are we going in that direction? I, I mean, are, are we, I mean any, anyone on the panel, do you, do you believe that we are going down that road that is going to lead to a, a, a new, more equitable global order. Yes, Ken. I mean, I guess a point that needs to be made is, you mentioned earlier, is this, you know, new players and the old guard. The challenge is the old guard, if we assume the old guard is the United States, doesn't want to play that role right now. Donald Trump doesn't want to play that guardian of the international order role. He is talking about America first, and he's challenging every consensus that has been in place since the end of the world of World War II. So if the U.S. is not going to play that role of trying to uh, promote global values, et cetera, which country or groups of countries will? And that's really the bigger question. Or will no countries play that role? So if he is successful in stepping back as he has done so far, he doesn't really even have a U.S. foreign policy, what will fill that gap? But is, is anyone on the panel? Does Trump repre represent 
a larger group of people, not only in the United States, but, but abroad, yeah. who don't want to see that. I, you're smiling. I mean, I, let's, you know, we, we know Trump. We shouldn't. Let, let's keep American politics out of this. I like to look at Trump as the shibboleth here, as the, as, as the metaphor, as the metaphor. Is his isolationism, is his, this nonsense that we're seeing, this is obviously growing quicker than any move towards creating a new global order. Can I just jump go, in there? Go, go, jump yeah. in. I, I just think that the question here is not really about Trump. Right. It's, it's not about, Trump is just a reaction to the declining liberal world order. Uh, so the reactions are actually coming from within the Western world to begin with. This is why we're seeing the rise of the right as well in Europe. The question, I think, is about, it's not about whether the Western world or the United States per se wants to promote values or not promote values. Right. We really need to think about what is the intention behind promoting values. Are you promoting values to exert control? or are you promoting values to share them? I think this is the crux of the question. And when countries like Turkey are within their region promoting their values, what I call the moral hinterland of Turkey, it's not mm -hmm. to exert control, but to actually genuinely share those values. But the way the post-45 liberal world order was constructed, it was based on three pillars that reinforced each other. Economic interdependence, military power projection, and values. Uh -huh. well, now, the values, of course, there were part and parcel of this control. But I think where the West went wrong is that in that values pillar, we, and I'm putting my Western hat on now, but we in the West, I think, lost the spirit of Kennan and Acheson. Because when those men created this, well, were behind the creation of this order, and, and they had a lot to do with, you know, establishing that values pillar, there was a lot of sense of humanity in there. There was also humility. And I think the West lost that. And this is why the challenges to that are actually rising from the West first. Pat, Pan Wei said something interesting in your, in your comments. You, you, you said you were not rejecting the liberal world order, that there was a lot of positive. Let's pull the delegation up here, left to right. What is good and positive about the liberal world order? In, in its ideal form, <laughs> yes, it aims to stop misery and, and rise everyone from poverty. I mean, that's really okay. the, Steven? the ideal view. I think the liberal world order has caused as much damage as benefit in the world. And I think the whole question of the liberal world order being associated with values is a very, very fragile assumption now. I was in Charlottesville in the United States just before it kicked off. I think that society is sick. So there's no value left in the liberal world order as you see it? I, Go, no. I, I don't think the, it's not a matter of the values not being left there. It's about, I think, institutions that were supposed to embody those values are now cruising on autopilot, and they just have a knee-jerk reaction to whatever they see as something not representing what they think the world ought to be like. And because they've lost the meaning of the words, the concepts, and the values that they embodied, mm -hmm. they just keep repeating them without really understanding it. And I'm finding this a lot in forums where you get together, uh, you know, largely transatlantic, you know, people, thinkers. We're still talking about as if the world is in the 90s. And this really worries me. You're right. Because, you know, I actually said this in the Brussels forum two years ago. I said, you know, I am really worried that, you know, we're a group of people sitting here and 20 years from now, we'll still be a group of people, same people sitting here, talking about the same concepts dated from the 90s, and the world outside will have changed beyond our recognition, and the sad thing is we'll no longer be part of it. Uh -huh. And I think this is where the West is heading right now. There's a huge, I mean, I'm not saying there's one blind spot, there's a number of blind spots. And for that to change, I think we need to work on discourses. Well, yeah, we need but, to but, change but, discourses about 
what what are these real values? What is really happening in this world? Right well, now? you've got it. You've got yeah. But forget to get from A to B, you got to know where A is. And I'm not sure we actually know what the old global world order is. We know what it was. What, well, we, we know what we it was. Wait, what's good? What's uh, you know? I find that I found that statement coming from you fascinating. One of the old, probably the oldest culture in the world, China. <laughs> you know. That there is that Western, there's something in Western global democracy, a uh, Western liberal order. What, what, what? Give us one or two ingredients from from what we're trying to defenestrate here that are actually worth saving. I think China appreciates this uh, world order as labeled as uh, liberal or <coughs> with so-called with embedded liberal values. Uh, I think uh, the appreciation mainly comes from the emphasis on openness mm -hmm. and exchange of people and goods and also capital. Um, other than that, uh, about those um, societies, uh, fairly minority societies, values, social values, is called the mainstream values. That's what in China, we can't agree with. I see. When it comes to, when it comes to getting rid of the old order, here's an expert. <laughs> you guys overthrew apartheid. Talk about an old order, horrible. You, you're trying to rebuild a new society. Kingsley, tell us what, what is in that old global order that's worth keeping? Well, the, the positive element that came out of the liberal old, uh, world order was to prevent another world war and to prevent a conflict amongst powerful countries. That's very positive. But post the Cold War, this world order has failed to embrace and understand the diversity that exists and understand the ethnic diversity that exists even within the West, so to say. And that's why you've seen this challenges, conflict in, in the former Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. was basically to understand the diversity of ethnicity and how to manage it. And now you start to see ethnicity being elevated to be the main driver of conflict, be it in, in Syria, in, in Libya, in the DRC. Um, now you're seeing a conflict building up the Rohingya community that have been pushed out, ethnicity, it's an issue that the New World Order cannot manage that. I think there's a need in managing this diversity that exists. Managing, the world. managing. Okay, then let's get down to the, some of the DNA that we're supposed to be addressing here this morning. How do we put together, if we can be put together, uh, a managerial structure that supplants structures such as NATO, such as Wall Street, such as the FTSE in London. How, how, do we, how do you establish the counterbalance? Do we put together a company? Do we start a mini UN? How do we do this, folks? Tell us, I, anyone, how I do we do this? I think we need to invest, we need to invest a lot of resources in managing the diversity and the conflict that emanates out of the diversity. Multicultural, many Instead countries. Of spending a lot of resources in building strong military power, we don't have system that can adequately address the challenges that exist in China's this not going to reduce not their military, no, I, China's not going to reduce their military budget. I don't, I, uh, I, I, I don't think Turkey is going to reduce their military budget. I think what you're saying is a nice idea. Kingsley, you're going to get angry at me later. Kingsley's actually a friend of mine, folks. You're talking like a sociology professor, but I still love you. How do we do this? How do we set up a structured counterbalance to the what I will call the old world order, which I think everyone on this panel agrees has gotten us into a lot of trouble? How do we do that? What's the management structure? Prime Minister nailed it on the head today in his opening remarks to this conference. You can't do everything at once, so your huge recipe of this, that, and the other right. isn't going to work. But I think the first thing that has to be done is reforming the Security Council of the United Nations. Yeah. 
Once you've got that down, and you've got a greater equality and participation in making strategic decisions to do with life, death, war, and peace, then you've got to step forward to addressing all Concrete. of these other issues. Concrete. What do you what do you what do you think? Way that it, would would China get behind uh, reorganizing the Security Council of the United Nations to have more permanent members on it who represent other cultures, other parts of the world, other interests? Tough question. I I think the uh, th there is another way to see the world order, and if you are an institutionalist, you would see the world is governed by United Nations, World Bank, IMF, and so on, and uh, or even UNESCO, huh? and uh, then uh, uh, you may see the other way around to say mm -hmm. that those institutions actually is based on power, ba based on American dollar, based, uh, based on American 10, 12 uh, aircraft carriers. So it seems that in the future, the world is not going to have this polar or unipolar world. So it would be a world without a pole. And uh, that's why I guess this forum is labeled that world of uncertainty. And uh, in that way, I, I do also agree with the Prime Minister's speech just now, tolerance, respect, mutual respect, and so on. Culturally, res uh, mutual respect and tolerance. I think th those are important things. And of, of course, I know that might offend some uh, mm -hmm. very ideological people. But I think equal, I mean, fair trade, openness, and exchange of uh, more people and more goods and more capital, that would promote peace. Yeah. Well, wait, you know, there was something Wei said there that's it's really interesting. He used the phrase U.S. dollar. Karen, what happens if the world tomorrow decides to price oil, say, in Turkish lira, no longer in U.S. dollars? What's that going to do? Well, you think about that at your think tank? Not so much, because I don't think that's likely to happen. I think it's... Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, excuse me. I think... Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, it's not <laughs> likely to happen, but does it need to happen to change the global order? You know, I think this is actually a really fascinating discussion, because I do think there are some major shifts happening right now, and I think we're all trying to grapple with what it means, and we're trying to grapple with what does it mean if the U.S. isn't the sole superpower. I think the U.S. will still be a superpower because of its, its economic and military might for, for, for some time to come. But other players, other significant players, China, uh, Turkey, Brazil, uh, are playing a major role. I'm also, though, a believer in systems and processes. And, you know, what, it, what the concern is, is will this be anarchic? And, uh, will, you know, will we end up with a, a world where lots of regional powers do different things in different parts without Big some sort of overarching structure. And so that's, that's also the concern if the U.S. will be pulling back from a leadership role. Whether or not you like the U.S. playing that leadership role, there is some sort of anchor and reliability about it. Okay. Can I just jump in? Yeah, go, please. I, I just think that, you know, what Karen underlined there is this essential Western fear as this order is declining, that any alternative to it will be this descent into this chaos of darkness. And I say that that is not necessarily the only alternative. When you posed your question, you said, you know, what do we create instead of this right. order? And I think there's essentially something wrong with that question as well. We don't need to completely sweep it off the table and replace it with something else because we can't it's declining but it's still very much robust and there but i think the key word there as steven mentioned is reform we need to reform in the present order institutions that includes the un security council reform which is something the president always repeats and it's a subject close to his heart and ideas. We need to reform existing institutions and ideas. That way, those who are 
really clinging tightly to this declining world order in fear that, you know, if it, if it collapses, then if America decides not to play this leadership role, we're going to descend into chaos, are going to see that, you know, there is actually another alternative whereby they can work with this multipolar or, or uh -huh. polarless world, new partners, and with greater diversity and equality, it's actually a win-win. Uh, it's not a lose-lose, but this order, instead of having been replaced by a new one, it needs to transform, and that transformation has to be quite uh, dramatic. Uh, it's not going to happen suddenly, but it's not just going to happen from within. The West needs to transform by working with uh, partners, allies, uh, other actors in different regions, and work in cooperation to transform the order that it established itself. That's what but I think there's a resistance to that mm -hmm. from the West, and that's the problem. They don't want to reform. And I think, you know, if you don't want to reform your institutions and your ideas, then you're going to be stuck in the same discourses, and then you're going to descend into the chaos that you so fear. Ladies and gentlemen, we just made a lot of progress. I want to point this out to you. Words are very important, particularly when it comes to discussions like this. I want you all to pay attention to the title of what this forum is. Inspiring change in an age of uncertainty. When we put these kind of panels together in discussions, the ideas we put out, very broad brushstroke ideas, and we try to refine them. We try to get to the DNA of this. What Gulmer just said, and everyone up here just said, I, I am going to go out on a limb here. I think TRT World Forum, myself included, we made a mistake in this. It should be not inspiring change. It should be inspiring reform. There is a big difference. Reform is something people can deal with. If I have to tell you that you've got to change, you're not going to like that, are you? But reform is change, right? No, I think change, no, words are important. I think change, oh, what do you people think? Is change too hard a word, or should it be reform? I'm asking you, if you think it's reform, raise your hand. You think it's reform. If you think we need to reform the world order, let me know. There's very few. How many think we need to change the world order? Oh, boy. I lost that vote, didn't I? Okay. You're, you're laughing. Okay. Tell me in 30 seconds why we need to get... Can you get this guy a microphone up here? He's chuckling. I want him. Get a microphone up here. No, no, here. No, we're just, someone's coming to you with one. Someone's coming to you with a microphone. In, 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 in no, in, th in, in, in 45 seconds, 45 seconds, because we have time, we, you know, that's how we do it. Why do we need to change as opposed to reform? Tell me, tell us. It's not on, can we turn the mic on? Mic on here, no. The mic's not on. Can we get this gentleman's mic okay. on, people? Go ahead. My time has started. So we are talking about all abstract stuff so far. Right. When we talk about concrete and very tangible things, we're stuck there, right? So who is going to put that uh, example in front of us? Underdeveloped world or developed ones? So those guys are talking about, yes, they need to change something and they need to show and prove that they all work. That's it. Okay. Fair enough. Did you change South Africa? Or did you reform it after apartheid? Well, Truth and Reformation Committee? No, you reform. You introduce new changes that you reform. Mm. And the changes are emerging even within the new global order. Take the, 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 the G20. Yeah. It used to be G7 countries that are determining the welfare of all of us around the world. It has expanded to include 20 countries. And there's a view that there must be more countries that are having a voice within that forum. So you're getting new institutions that are emerging, the alternative to the existing order. And they are emerging without any control. That's where the challenge is. You oh, need to determine the direction they need to take and, and come up with issues they need to address in the process. Stephen, I want to go one step further on this reform change. I can tell you from the West, if you tell me to change, I'm not going to like you anymore. It's a Western concept. If you talk to Americans about reforming, they might give you a hearing. Are we having a, uh, 
uh, a collision of words here, a collision of definitions culturally? Educators. It's a collision of definitions, a collision of words certainly, just as you say. But whichever word you choose, it's going to involve some change. I mean, the G20, as Kingsley was saying, when it became more important than the G7 and the G8, was a major shift in the way the world deliberated, at least. It was a major shift in what was included in global agendas. That was a reform that was also change-making. So when you talk about institutional reform, you're also talking about changes in the way people have ideas about how to view the world. And I think that people are afraid because people are very much set in their own values. We talk about values, and this is key to everything, whether we talk about institutions, change, or reform, but people don't want to give up their values. I think that Kingsley is not quite right in saying we've got a clash of ethnicities as a future landscape. We do have a clash of confessional thought, a religious clash, which is very, very evident internationally. That involves ideas, that involves values that are very, very dearly held, embedded in the DNA of what each country holds very, very close to their hearts. Until we break out of that and open ourselves up to a true exchange between theological values and the moral underpinnings of those theological values, we can talk about reform and change until the cows come home. Wait, tell me something. What, it, it, going from what Stephen just said, what, what are the, forget the politics of it for a moment. When the Chinese sit down to discuss these matters with Westerners, what are the, are, are there still like cultural barriers between the way the Chinese think and, and, and Americans and Europeans think, even after all the years that China has been in the forefront of the global economy, the growth of uh, its power, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, are, are, are these, are those, you know, old hoary petards, are they, are, are they still there? What are they? Uh, yes, I think uh, there, are, there is a very profound cultural difference. Uh, for example, Chinese would not think that China would become a world hegemon, would not perceive this kind of a scenario, mm -hmm. um, uh, and even do not think that there is a need of this hegemon. So uh, uh, you might say this is a more liberal kind of a perception, uh, perception in our world order. And uh, the cultural difference are three. Number one, all the previous hegemons spread their own language, like Spanish, or during the time of Pax Britannica, or Pax Americana. And then Chinese would not say there will be an epoch of Pax Seneca. And uh, why? Because there is impossible uh, to spread this language. It's very difficult to to, to communicate with this vast 20% of the people on this planet. And uh, because we use the only one that use non-alphabetical characters, pictoric characters. So it's very difficult for others to brainwash Chinese and it's even more difficult for Chinese to brainwash the other parts of the world. <laughs> we cannot communicate <laughs> with each other. It's very difficult unless we use English. And uh, trying to say 1.4 billion people to be English speaking, that's mission impossible. And uh, the second one is that Chinese does not provide the world with the spirituality, with spirit, spiritual aspiration. We're a very secular people from 2,500 years ago. And uh, so never become religious. So that Chinese does not have Korean, does not have Bible, does not have communist manifesto or liberal democracies, things like that, spiritual needs. The third one is that Chinese are not very good at military. Um, you might say China would build a strong military force, yes, but it's mainly for defense purposes. So no Bible, no sword, no language 
how can Chinese dominate the world? So Chinese never thinking that way to dominate other <laughs> part of the world and spread their social norms, political systems on others. So China has a proverb, Chinese never govern non-Chinese citizens. Kingsley, I, I saw you, I was gonna say hegemons, we, they don't always play a negative role. I was very much complimentary of the United States as a hegemon. When they challenged FIFA, which was operating outside the norms and rules that have been determined in the world. Excellent point. And fixed that system. That's when I gave a vote for the US, I said, go for it, establish order and behave, and behavior that is acceptable in the society, because FIFA was getting out of control. Mm -hmm. We have about five minutes left. Yes, sir, I, you, you've been raising your hand. You got a question? Keep it short and pithy, please. Adel Hamazia, uh, Oxcap, so I find it very difficult to be concise, but um, <laughs> I shall try nevertheless. Um, very insightful, very interesting. Um, for me, one elephant in the room, if I may, we've addressed it somewhat, would be the thesis that we've been hearing from another Harvard professor, Graham Allison, on Thucydides' trap. Uh, I'd be very keen for um, our colleagues to address this point somewhat. Um, uh, our colleague from Peking suggested that uh, Chinese military might centers around defense. But as you increase your economic assets in Africa, the Middle East, and, and in fact, we, we are discussing, uh, considering and thinking about one oil, one oil pricing, vis-a-vis -vis Saudi oil at least, um, you established an overseas military base for the first time earlier this year in Djibouti. You appointed an envoy to Syria last year. So to suggest that China is not uh, embarking on change, perhaps reform depending on the, the wording that you choose. I, I'm not sure if I would absolutely agree with that. And going back to the Sparta well, wait, Athens you, analogy, you, I'd be very yeah. keen to hear thoughts from maybe the security side of things and perhaps the economic as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, that's, I was kind of hinting at that before, and I thank you for bringing it up again. Let's, let's, let's start with Karen. Should we be worried about uh, uh, what Americans call, excuse me, way? I'm going to be American here for a moment. China's aggressive ways in Africa with money and military? Are you worried at that, about that at your think tank? I mean, you know, we're worried about a lot of things <laughs> in my think tank. But, um, I mean, I think there's, there's, a different, there's two different things. China has been uh, investing economically in Africa for decades, so that's not new. The roads in Somalia 50 years ago were built by the Chinese, and the Chinese, uh, has, has, as you've been saying, has been investing in infrastructure, and that's one of the priorities. At the same time, there have been military advances. We've seen a resurgent China. We're not sure where it might go. Be interested to hear uh, from our colleagues here where it might go. Uh, but I, I, if I could make, can I make a macro point, or will you come back to me on that a little later? Uh, okay, no, I, I, I want to, yeah. well, let, let me, let's just go away for a quick second here on this. A lot of people are frightened about China's advances in Africa. Why shouldn't why shouldn't the old guard, the old way, which, you know, I, I mean, Willie keeps talking about how they've got to keep thinking differently, but the fact is they're still thinking the way they used to think 20 years ago. Uh, tell us why they should not be afraid of these economic and military, uh, economic investments in military installations. I mean, that's a question, you know, make news. I think Chinese uh, in Africa is mainly doing business and trying to leave some profit in the local uh, infrastructure construction. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of a new type of uh, business partner, unlike before. Mm -hmm. And uh, the kind of a colonial uh, uh, practice, as well as taking all the money away because the corporation has shareholders. They cannot just leave some certain proportion of the profit in the local area. So they say Chinese investment is not up to the standard of the international standard or the Western standard saying that, hey, that bad government is bad, you should not invest there. So bad or good, it all depends on, on their decision. So but for, for Chinese, it's, a, it's just trade. So it's a ch trading state. And as to say Chinese military force, let me quote this, Chinese invested huge amount of money in Sudan. And then some countries stirred up trouble and then uh, 
separated the two countries, and then uh, Chinese lost a lot of money. And then also Chinese invested a lot in Libya, and then they say Libya has, uh, has this rebellion. You're losing and then now money? We, and we lost a huge amount of money, and then they know it. Those countries who are behind this kind of a, uh, political turmoil, they know that the target is China. But then Chinese simply withdraw and say, hey, hey, we, we take a risk and lost the money and then lost. That's it. Stephen? I mean, can I jump in here? Because I've been advising <coughs> African delegations and trade negotiations with China for more than 10 years now. And there has been a learning curve for the Chinese from a posture of extreme naivety when I began doing this in 2007. They've actually acquired some sophistication which was not there at the beginning. So I do agree that the Chinese do not have malign ambitions for Africa. At the same time, they certainly have what I would call retrograde views mm -hmm. of the African. And those retrograde views have mm -hmm. changed. At the same time, what you've got is an increase in African negotiating ability as well. So the two are meeting at some point in time. I should make a brief point about Chinese military projection. They've got no military projection in the normal sense. Their aircraft carrier is a refurbished Ukrainian scrap heap. It's more operational than the British <laughs> aircraft carrier, which has no planes right now. Uh, but it's got no naval projection power whatsoever. It's based in Djibouti. Every superpower has got a base in Djibouti. The Djiboutians are minting money out of this. You're right. So uh, we, there's nothing sinister about any of this. But we, have a, we have a few moments left. Go ahead, Gorn. Well, I think it's about, well, you mentioned the Tupidus trap, and I'll say that, you know, it is a realist world, and there are different ways and means of exerting influence. And, you know, China's a major power. Of course, it's going to ex exert influence. I mean, we shouldn't expect it to do otherwise. It's, mm -hmm. a, you know, that, that's what they're going to do. But I think well, the problem, again, this is about reading. I really have a problem with the way West is reading things. And I think, you know, the, uh, the way the West is reading, again, what China is doing is that they're reading it from the lens of their own ways and means of exerting influence. Each country, each power, especially rising powers, will have different ways and means of exerting influence, and we shouldn't expect them not to exert influence. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a win-win scenario here either. And for example, uh, the Belt Road Initiative is something that's very positive in the sense that you know Turkey's uh, playing a huge role in the middle corridor of that, and they're uh, spending a lot of money on, on infrastructure of this, and you're right, China's not spending a lot of money here on that, Turkey is, I know for, for sure, uh, but that's good for Turkey. So there is, I mean, it, you know, if this is going to herald a new kind of cooperation that's going to reinvigorate, reinvigorate world trade then and, and rebuild infrastructure on this route, then it benefits countries like Turkey. So we shouldn't always read uh, new initiatives or new ventures as necessarily something that's challenging in the bad way. We need to accept them for what they are. And there's nothing long, wrong with cooperation as long as, and new ventures of cooperation, as long as it doesn't lead to challenges that lead to uh, new misunderstandings. So uh, the bottom line is, uh, you know, everyone will have their own ways and means of exerting influence. And that's something we need to understand. Okay, well, this first session is ending. I hope you found it interesting, and I hope what it's done for you is at least set a paradigm for what we hope the next two days are going to be all about. <laughs> These issues, as I said at the beginning, are very complex. They can be very antagonistic, but hopefully I think all of our panelists here address the big bore issues, and we try to chop it down to the DNA. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Enjoy your lunch. One of the great things about Turkey, I always judge a country not by its politics, not by its religion. I judge it by its food. And let me tell you, if this is your first visit here, there is no country better to eat than Turkey. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.